Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us here at the Graber Road Church Christ YouTube page. We are conducting a Sunday morning, particularly, study of the life of Abraham and what God had to say about him, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And thank you so much for joining us. Hope you grab a sheet of paper and uh, something to write with, and that the study this morning will be helpful and beneficial to you as we study about this great man of faith known as Abraham. Would it surprise you to know that Abraham is mentioned in 27 of 66 of the books of our Bible? If you look at the Jews and how they treated him and how they talked about him and how they revered him, you would say, here is a man of importance. In fact, the New Testament writers, whenever they would write about him, they would write about him as a man of tremendous faith and import for the New Testament age. But the question becomes, what does God say about his servant Abraham? It's interesting to me that you can learn a whole lot about a person by what their friends, what their family, what people that know them say about them. In fact, Proverbs writer uh, Solomon would say in Proverbs 22 and verse 1 that a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and loving favor more than silver and gold. Do you have a good name? Are you a person that if I went and asked somebody about you and said, uh, tell me about this person, would they say, oh yes, I understand that he is a man of integrity or a woman of integrity. I understand that they're a person that you can count on no matter what. What does God say about us? What does God say about his servant Abraham? A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And ultimately, folks, it's really what God says about us that's important. Here are a number of things and a number of titles that God gives through his word to this servant Abraham and how they relate to us in our study. The very first one we want to look at is this one. Abraham is known as, known by God as a father of a multitude. Father of a multitude. He was originally called, you remember, Abram. The first time we're introduced to him at the very end of Genesis chapter 11, beginning of Genesis chapter 12, that's what his name means. It's just Abram. It's in Hebrew, it's simply exalted father. That's kind of a cruel irony, as we've made mention of before, that here's a man by the name of an exalted father when he absolutely doesn't have any children, no heirs to his name. And as he's Going about his course, and as God calls him there in Genesis chapter 12, and as he follows God faithfully, there's a period and a point in time where God decides to change his name. He says, no longer will you be called Abram, but you'll be called Abraham. In the Hebrew language, it's the difference of just one letter. But that one letter translates his name from being exalted father to father of a multitude or father of many nations. He was 99 when God changed his name to that. When God changed his name, you know how many children Abraham had? He still had none that were of his, uh, him and his wife's union. And what a great verse to think about when we think about Abram or Abraham and his life and about the way that God used him and the way that God teaches us a lesson about faith that even when we don't have bodily, and even when we can't put our fingers on something that God has promised to us, we know that we can trust in God because he who promised is faithful. Look at this verse with me, please, from Romans chapter 4. That's where this uh, passage comes from, Romans chapter 4. In the context, what he's doing is he's describing to these Jewish Christians and these Gentile Christians and saying, it's not the fact that Judaism justifies you. We talked about that last week with regard to uh, the Pharisees and how they hitched their name to Abraham, hoping that his righteousness would somehow rub off on them. But what Paul has to do here in this passage is say, Abraham was justified by faith before ever, he, uh, before ever his descendants knew about the law and knew about the law of Moses. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But as he talks about this in the context, look down at verse 16 and 17 of Romans chapter 4. The Bible says, therefore, it is of faith that might be according to grace so that the promise, what God said, might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, that is the Jewish uh, who come out and accept Christianity, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham. Here's people that don't know the law of Moses and here's people that, uh, that, that don't come out of Judaism. 
But he says, Abraham, who is the father of us all, father of many nations, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, verse 17. In the presence of him who, uh, whom he believed, God, who gives, note this, life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Different translation, I appreciate this one. God calls those things which are not as though they were. In God looking at Abraham, God could see Abraham's faith. And as Abraham continued to trust him, God said, Abraham, your name is that, father of many nations. Don't forget that. That's the identity that I've given you. Now, his promise hadn't come true yet. He still hadn't had the birth of Isaac. He, had, he would have that at a ripe old age of 100 and next year over. But God gave him that name when he still didn't have any children. Abraham is known as a father of a multitude by God. Abraham is secondly known as this, the Hebrew. The Hebrew. He is the first one in Scripture to be called a Hebrew. It refers maybe to one who had descended from Eber. That is uh, he, uh, Genesis chapter 11 and verse 14. It says, Salah lived to be 30 years and then he begot Eber. Maybe Eber is the part of the name that comes, that we get Eberu or Hebrew. Look at Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13. The one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. God establishes through Abram, Abraham a people and a language. In fact, most all references to the word Hebrew in the New Testament have to do with the writer translating a Hebrew word into the Greek for the, writer to under, or for the reader rather, to understand. Looking over this, realizing there's a national designation of Hebrew, it came as a result of these people being children of the one who was simply called father of a multitude. That designation of Hebrew is what Abraham's name was, and that's what his children became known as. And it's particularly because of his faith. God calls Abraham father of many nations. God calls Abraham the Hebrew. God calls Abraham my servant. My servant. One man said, happy is the one who God calls his servant. We look at the catalog of names and the people that are associated with Abram and have this exalted, wonderful designation of being called God's servants. Look first at Moses. Moses. Numbers chapter 12, verse 7. God, in answering uh, Aaron and Miriam's call, it seems like what they're doing is a, they're <laughs> kind of in a desert and they're, they're um, instigating a coup. Has God only spoken through Moses? And God, in answering and talking about Moses and his character, God is going to say, it's not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. What a wonderful, wonderful legacy and what a wonderful thing for God to say that Moses was his servant. What about Caleb, Numbers chapter 14, verse 24, God in answering people that um, were going to appoint for themselves a captain, go back to into Egypt because they didn't have faith in God to go through the promised land and be able to go into the promised land and, and conquer it. And God tells the people and God tells Moses, he says, my servant Caleb, because he's had a different spirit in him and followed me fully, I will bring him into land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. God calls Caleb and Moses, his servants. God says that of David, 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 18. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save Israel by the, from the hands of the Philistines and from the hands of all their enemies. David was known as a servant of God. How about Job? In Satan coming and presenting himself before Job, or excuse me, as Satan coming and presenting himself before God, you find that God says, have you considered my servant Job? Job chapter 1 and verse 8, that there's none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Job had the designation of being my servant. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 3, the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah in speaking to rebellious Judah and letting him know there's judgment coming, God says, Isaiah, you need to listen to him. He is my servant. 
Zerubbabel, as he led the people back into the land of uh, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, the land of promise from captivity. Haggai chapter two, verse twenty-three. God is speaking again through the prophet Haggai and says, "In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shetail, says the Lord, and I'll make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts." Jesus Himself bore the designation of my servant. In prophecy, Isaiah 42 and verse 1, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And we read a, uh, the fulfillment of that over in Matthew chapter 12. There's no doubt of who this refers to. Matthew 12 verse 18, Behold, my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I'll put my spirit upon him, he'll declare justice to the Gentiles. Lest we forget who we're talking about in the study, you look at Abraham and what God says to his son Isaac about him in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 24. I am the God of your, that is Isaac's father, Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you, Isaac. I'll bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. Brothers and sisters, it's not what we are, it's what he says we are. And looking at the terms for New Testament Christians and thinking about your life and my life, you think about the fact that God wants us and understands that we are his servants. Passages like Colossians chapter 3 and verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Hebrews 12 verse 28, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let's have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Do you realize that if you're a faithful Christian, God refers to you as my servant if you're living your life for the glory of God and for the cause of Christ, God says, you're my servant. What a wonderful thing Jesus has given us in that reputation and that character and that title of servant as we're following in the master's steps. What does God refer to Abraham as? He says, Abraham is my friend, my friend. Isaiah 41 and verse 8. But you, O Israel, are my servant, Jacob, to whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. I love James chapter 2, study of James chapter 2 about faith and works. And right there in the midst of that discussion, it says, James 2, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Once again, Abraham being justified by his faith, being shown to have an alive faith here in James chapter 2, based upon his works, and it says he was called a friend of God. We cannot be a friend of God without three things. And Troy dealt with them a few weeks ago, but let's revisit right now to talk about that. We cannot be a friend of God without trusting God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. We have got to put our trust and our faith in God and say, I'm going to believe him and I'm going to act in the way that he wants us to act. It involves that just doing that, what we just mentioned, that we walk with God. Amos 3 verse 3 asks a rhetorical question, Ten, two walk together unless they're agreed? And the answer rhetorically is no. I've got to listen to God. I've got to heed his word if we're going to walk together. But then there's a loving God supremely. Jesus, in answering the question, what's the greatest commandment? Genesis, uh, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Once again, as much as God can call us his servants, we can call ourselves friends of God. But not if we try and make ourselves friends of the world as well. James chapter 4, verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses. If you want to be friends of the world, you're putting yourself at enmity with God. That means we're no longer friends. 
Abraham followed God faithfully. He walked with God, and he loved God supremely, and he was called God's friend. What else does God say about his servant, about his friend, about this father of many nations, about this Hebrew, Abraham? God calls Abraham justified. Justified. The word justified is a legal word. It means to stand before the court with no charges. To stand before the court justified, never sinned. To stand before the court and have the court say, we've got no claim on you. Notice it's different than standing before the court and having a not guilty plea or having the, the judge declare you're not guilty. That's different because that says you did something wrong and now you're going to be put on trial for it. Listen, God knows that we've done wrong. The whole point of Romans chapter 3 is to say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. There is none righteous, no, not one, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. And so we stand before the court without the blood of Jesus, and God says, you are guilty. But what the blood of Jesus does is it comes along, it cleanses us to make it where we stand before the court, and the court says, you're right, legally justified, never sinned. There's no claim, there's no charge that can be brought against you because of the blood of Jesus. You're a perfect 10 if you like those terms. And so in using that, and using that thought, Romans chapter four, Paul launches into this argument as using the chief that the Jews would have respected, that is Abraham, and is telling the, the, the people, you can be justified by your faith. You can be made righteous by your faith. You can be made right in the sense of the court based upon your belief just like Abraham had. Look at these verses here, Romans. Well, let's read Romans uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, is found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, by things that he'd done, if Abraham were justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. That is, if Abraham had stood before the court and said, look at what a good person I am, God, there wouldn't be any amount of good works that could have made him righteous to make him not guilty based upon what he's done. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies, who makes a person just as he ought to be, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of a man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Here's the words of David. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Once again... God justified Abraham, Abraham by his faith. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 says, the just is going to live by his faith. That's at the very beginning of the book of Romans. When an individual humbly and submissively trusts and obeys God for salvation, that person is going to find themselves to be right before God, right before the court in a legal sense. What a tremendous blessing to know that not only was Abraham justified by his faith, not by the law of Moses, but Abraham was justified by his faith, and you and I can be as well. What else does God say about his servant, about this justified Hebrew known as Abram, Abraham, the father of many nations, the one who's called the friend of God? God says he's one who listened to truth. One who listened to truth. Jesus, in having a discussion about, with the Jews, and talking about knowing the truth, and the truths will set them free, John 8, verse 31 and 32. The Jews arguing, kicking against this, and listening to Jesus and not accepting his words. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 40. He says, now you're seeking to kill me, a man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. The consequence of looking at that is saying Abraham did listen to truth. Abraham did believe the testimony of God. And now his descendants thousands of years later are looking at Jesus and saying, there's no way that that's right. There's no way that that's truth. One of the highest commendations is given to Abraham by Jesus himself. 
In this context, he would say that these descendants of Abraham were wholly unlike Abraham, who was the one who listened to and obeyed truth. Even today, if we listen to truth, if we make it our business to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness, like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, we're going to be filled. We're going to be set free. We're going to be justified if we listen to and obey that truth. And we can be justified and we can be people who are set free, lovers of truth. What else does God say about Abraham? God says Abraham is in paradise. We're going to take a lesson a little while later in the quarter, Lord willing, and deal with this subject especially uh, deeply. But for right now, let's notice a couple of things. The first thing is, is that Abraham is still alive. Abraham is still alive. Luke chapter 16 and verse 22, Jesus telling the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. I say it's a parable, it's a story, it's a a, a tragic account of the rich man. Whatever it is and however you want to view Luke chapter 16, notice that Jesus says that beggar Lazarus was carried away and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. The rich man also was died and was buried. Jesus, in talking about the calling of the gospel, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus said, And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And in justifying himself and his, his ministry and talking uh, to these Jews, these rebellious, hard hearted leaders of the Jews, He asked this rhetorical question. He said, how in the world is God going to say that I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. One more passage, John 8 and verse 56. Jesus, in that same same conversation that he was dealing with those Jews who refused to listen to truth, who were of their father the devil, he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it, and he was glad. Paradise waits for those who, like Abraham, die in the Lord, Revelation 14 and verse 13. And again, we'll discuss that more in a future lesson. Abraham is in paradise, alive. Last one. Bible calls Abraham a stranger on the earth. A stranger on the earth. And seeking a burial plot for his wife, Sarah, Abraham has to go to the sons of Heth. He has to go before these people and uh, bargain, uh, Genesis chapter 23. But notice how Abraham calls himself here in these, the land of these Canaanites. He says, I am a foreigner. I am a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you that I can bury my dead out of my sight. After Abraham left Ur of Chaldees, after Abraham left Haran, he spent the rest of his life dwelling in tents. He spent the rest of his life dwelling on foreign soil. And what he's become to us as Christians is us leaving this old life behind, leaving the things of this world behind and confessing that we're pilgrims, we're strangers, we're temporary here on this earth. If we desire to follow Jesus, we've got to make that confession like Abraham that this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Consider this passage as we close this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. He went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Brothers and sisters, you and I can have the same relationship with God as Abraham had. That's a wonderful thing. We can have the same testimony of faith that we fully followed God the same way as Abraham did. We can have many of the titles that God calls Abraham for ourselves based upon our own relationship with God. What a wonderful promise and thing to think about and what a blessing. But the blessing comes through his son, Jesus Christ. The blessing comes from the son of Abraham, the son of God, the son of David, the one who God sent into this world, who is going to be the blessing for all nations of the earth 
as he promised to Abraham way back when in Genesis chapter 12. Do you know him this morning? Do you have a good relationship with him? If God said about you to somebody else a testimony of your relationship with him, would he say, my friend Andy? Would he say, my servant? Would he say, a person who has been justified? A person who is walking, listening to truth? A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And I hope that we're all seeking the testimony of God in him defining who we are and saying who we are. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. I hope this has been helpful.